Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Morning. How nice of you all to get up so early on this sea day to come and see me. Thank you. Today, I'm going to do my talk entitled, Who is Norway's Greatest Polar Explorer? I'm sure we've all heard, heard of Amundsen, but in fact there were others who came before him that you may not be aware of. But I'm going to start with a South Pole base camp, and that is called Amundsen Scott. And my question is, was Amundsen the greatest polar explorer from Norway? Or is he just the most famous? <clears throat> By looking at some of the differences between Amundsen on the left and Scott, we can learn a lot about Amundsen. He used Inuit fur clothing and he used skis, as many Norwegians did for their cross-country skiing. It's one of the skills they have in the country. Scott, on the other hand, had modern Arctic clothing and snowshoes. Amundsen's choice was much better. Fur is warmer, there's less condensation, and skiing is faster. Amundsen's original plan, he was to go to the North Pole. And as usual, he took a very small team with him because his objective was that one thing, he wasn't doing anything else. But when he was told that both of the Americans, Frederick Cook and Robert Peary, had beaten him to it, he changed his objective without telling anyone. And as it turned out, both Cook and Peary's claims to have reached the North Pole have never been proven. Now the difference between the two poles is that in the South Pole, you can put a flag in the ground and it will stay there. When you go to the North Pole, it's on a floating polar ice cap. You put a flag down in the right place and tomorrow it's gone. <laughs> and when he borrowed the Fram from Fridtjof Nansen, it was on condition that he finished some scientific work for Nansen at the North Pole. Scott's team, as you can see, was very large and they did a fantastic amount of scientific work. And then Scott got to the South Pole second, and he died on the way back. And along with all that other work, meant that Amundsen's achievement was overshadowed. So let's review Amundsen's main achievements. He was the first to sail through the Northwest Passage across the top of Canada. And that's his little ship. And this is him mixing with the Inuit where he learnt their ways. And then of course he was the first to get to the South Pole, even though he was not supposed to be there. And he was so intent on getting there, he set out too early in the season. And they had to go back and he nearly lost one of his men because he didn't really care. And then, of course, his triumph was eclipsed by the Scott tragedy. And that made him very unhappy. Lastly, he also accompanied the Italian Umberto Nobile on the first proven visit to the North Pole. And as they flew in the airship over the North Pole for the first time, Nobile here realised Amundsen had been using him to get fame and he wasn't happy. Amundsen always did things so that the world would notice him. It was a flaw in his character, and he had some others. One of his other weaknesses was the ladies, and this is his lover, the beautiful Norwegian Kiss Bennett, who was married to an Englishman. Now as a hero, he could have anyone, but he always seemed to be looking for the forbidden fruit and she was not his only married lover. Add to that his recklessness with money because he was not interested in earning it and you start to get an image of the man. All this tells us is that Roald Amundsen was a flawed character 
But now it's time to introduce some other Norwegians who came before him. There was Fridtjof Nansen, who I've already mentioned, Otto Sverdrup, Karsten Borchgrevink, and of course, Amundsen. And these are the four that actually deserve consideration as Norwegian's greatest polar explorer. So I'm going to start with Fridtjof Nansen. And this is him at the age of four. And doesn't he look like someone who is going somewhere? <laughs> he lived just north of Christiania. That would later become Oslo. In the summer, he fished and swam. In the autumn, he hunted for game in the forest. During the winter months, he was skiing. And like most Norwegians, he started skiing at the age of two before hmm. he could walk almost. Hmm. And at school, his studies took second place to expeditions into the forest. At 18, he broke the world one mile skating record. And in the following year, he won the National Cross Country Skiing Championship. He would repeat that feat 11 times. And then in 1880, he went to university to study zoology because he thought it would lead to an open air life. And it was in the year 1882 that his life was to change forever. And I quote his own words, the first fatal step that led me astray from the quiet life of science. His university professor had suggested <coughs> he should take a sea voyage to study Arctic zoology. He'd recently met the captain of this ship, the Viking, mm. And for five months, the ship roamed between Greenland and Spitsbergen, hunting seals. During that time, he became an expert marksman. And then in July, the ship was trapped in the ice, close to an unexplored section of the Greenland coast. He could see it, and he longed to go ashore. But it was impossible for him to get there. But he began to think then about crossing Greenland. But on the voyage, he didn't forget his scientific studies. And he designed this equipment shown here. And that collects water from different depths, water samples. And using that, he proved that below the ice, there is cold water. And that the warm Gulf Stream flows below that cold water. He was always interested in finding things out. And then he accepted a post at the curator in the zoological department of the Berger Museum. And here he studied the central nervous system of lower order marine creatures. Not quite my subject. <laughs> and in 1887, after finishing his doctoral thesis, he began organizing an expedition across the Greenland ice cap, using an idea that come for him from his time on the Viking. Now up until then, all the attempts to cross the Greenland ice cap had <coughs> failed. They'd all planned to do a return journey because there are no ports on the right hand side, on the east. So you've got to start in the west and then turn back. The weather conditions were terrible up there and all of the attempts failed after about 100 miles and they had to turn back because the conditions were so bad. Now the East Coast is very dangerous because there's all that ice flowing down it. But if you start from the East Coast, you only have to cross it once. So he thought that was a good idea. All he needed to do was get ashore from the ship. <laughs> he estimated the cost as 5,000 kroner, but his application for government funding was just dismissed, go away. And overwhelming public opinion that his plan was utter madness. But in Copenhagen, he met and charmed the wife of this man, Augustin Gamel. He's a Copenhagen <coughs> coffee merchant. And he agreed to fund the expedition. I wonder why. Single, articulate, and attractive to some, he was very much the ladies man. And there is a rumour that he had an affair with the wife of his sponsor. 
<laughs> he was very passionate, driven, and people were impressed by him. His books here are really well written, and many of the pictures I use are from his books. And he was also quite artistic. One key part of his plan was to use expert skiers, and he knew a lot of them, and they all refused to go with him. They thought it was madness. But when he put out his request for volunteers, three men did volunteer, but he needed a team of five more, he needed two more. So he sent a request north to the Sami people to see if they could provide him with two more people. Now he requested two Sami mountain people. They had to be single and they had to be under 40. Makes sense. Samuel Balto on the left was under 40, but he was coastal Sami, he wasn't mountain Sami. And apparently he was drunk when he signed on to go on this job. And Ole Nielsen Ravner on the right, now he was a mountain Sami, but he was married, he was 45, and he had children. Neither was what he wanted, but he was running out of time to do the job. And these two men, they weren't sure about whether to go with him or not, because Sami people were looked down on by many people then. They weren't sure what sort of reception they would get. But Nansen turned his charm on them, and he convinced them to come with him. <coughs> so as a team, the supplies were to be man-hauled on Nansen's own specially designed lightweight, light, lightweight sledges. In fact, most of the equipment, including sleeping bags, clothing, stoves, was all designed from scratch by Nansen himself. And the other volunteers were Otto Sverdra, who was a sea captain, his friend Christian Christensen, and sitting next to Nansen is Olaf Christian Dietrichsen, an army officer. That's the team. And the red line you see there is their planned route. Because Nansen believed that when he'd been trapped in the ice on the Viking, he'd seen a route up to the plateau from Sermilik. So they sailed north from the Icelandic port of Isafordjur, and the blue line is where they approached from the co to the coast. <coughs> At the coast, they could see the land 12 miles away but they were faced with a wall of ice. The only option they had was to launch his two small boats and man-haul them to the coast. The ice was impassable. There was no way they could get the boats full of materials to the coast. They had days of extreme frustration as they slowly drifted south, but they couldn't abandon the supplies because they're crucial to their journey. Add to that, Ravna, the mountain army, he's petrified of being on the ice. He's out of his natural environment. Now luckily, he had his Bible with him, and he took great comfort from reading it out loud all of the time. It must have driven the rest of them mad. Most of the time, they were simply camping on the ice. It was just too dangerous to launch the boats. That's because the ice keeps closing up suddenly. It would have wrecked them. They drifted 240 miles south, and here the ice dispersed a little, and they managed to launch the boats and get ashore. Unfortunately here, it was impossible to get up onto the plateau. It just wasn't possible. But the Sami were thrilled. They found there something called Senan grass growing. They used that grass inside their boots instead of socks. It was so good to change it. And in fact, Nansen tried it and he found it good as well. Behind the ice, they found more open water and they started rowing north. And they also found plenty of wildlife so they could replenish the stocks they'd been used as they drove, floated down the ice. Then some friendly Eskimos turned up in their kayaks. 
They couldn't speak to each other. Today we call those people Inuit. Would you believe they're on their annual summer journey north? And actually the two groups travelled together for a while. But it was a battle along the coast, getting the boats through the ice flows. They had to push them apart like this. They had to hack sharp bits off and they headed north for 12 days. Nansen now is getting concerned the summer is passing and at Umivik Bay he thinks he can see a route up to the plateau. So they set up camp here and they spend the next four days preparing to head up the glacier. The two boats are left as secure as possible just in case they had to turn back. But Nansen's motto was death or the west coast. He was going. Their target was Christian Hab, top left-hand corner, that's on the western shore of Disco Bay. It's now 370 miles away. It was a struggle going up the ice. Mm. Some of it was very steep, and they had to take parts of their supplies up and then go back for more. Occasionally they had to turn back because of large crevices. It was a journey into the unknown. Sometimes they even fell into the crevices, but they all survived because they were roped together. It was back-breaking work going up to the plateau, which was thought to be about 8,500 feet high. Finally, they reached the plateau. It's flatter now, but they're still going up, and there is very loose snow, and that makes skiing very difficult. And then a three-day winter storm stops them in their tracks and they have to hunker down. It's now that Nansen realises they could not reach Christian Harp before the last boat left for the winter. And that was why they changed course west toward Godtab. That's now called Nuke. And that shortened the journey by 93 miles. Eventually, they reached a maximum height of 8,921 feet above sea level. And here, the temperatures were dropping to minus 45 degrees centigrade at night. Really cold. Ravna, the mountain Sammy, is a lot happier because he's got no water under his feet. <coughs> but now it's Samuel Bolto's turn to complain. He reckons he can only manage half of the 100 kilograms he's supposed to be carrying and there's not enough food or coffee, perhaps he should go to the buffet. <laughs> and this is probably where Nansen realises that the Sami are not really suited to this sort of struggle. But luckily, from here on in, it's downward. The terrain is still rugged and the weather remains hostile. And progress is slow because there are fresh snowfalls and it makes dragging the sledges like pulling them through sand. Almost halfway across, the wind changed direction and the weather improves and they could tie the sledges together, raise the sail and ski in front of it to guide it. You needed to be a good skier to do that though. And at last, they battle their way down to the edge of a fjord on the east coast. Throughout the journey, <coughs> Olaf Dietrichson had maintained meteorological and geographical records. Recording scientific data was Nansen's priority. No one had crossed the ice cap before, not even the Eskimos. Reaching the coast, they're then faced with some open water and inlets, and they thought they were south of their final destination. So showing great adaptability, Sverdrup makes a makeshift boat using parts of the sledges, some willow that is growing there, and uses the frame of one of the tents to cover it. And whilst he did that, the rest created a camp for them to stay in, and they caught some wildlife. Three days later, Nansen and Sverdra begin the last stage of their journey, rowing down the fjord in this ramshackle boat, leaving the rest of the party hunker down. I mean, that's just unimaginable, isn't it? They arrive at Godtab and they've crossed in only 49 days 
Now, luckily, there's a missionary there. He lived with the Eskimos so they could talk to them. And he told them the last boat had left. They'd missed the boat. But 240 miles south, there is another boat due to leave in a couple of days. So Nansen writes a couple of letters, gives them to one of the local Eskimos, and he heads off in his kayak. And amazingly, he delivered those letters. So at least the people back home knew that they were safely across. And the other locals set off and brought the teams back. So they're all together nine days later. And they spent the winter months with the Eskimos learning about them. And that would lead to Nansen's second book, Eskimo Life. And then seven months later, a Danish ship arrived in the harbour and they were finally able to go home. Mm. The ship took them to Copenhagen and here Nansen and his companions are fated as heroes because they are the first true polar explorers who have achieved their mission. And a week later, these are the crowds in Christiania where between 30 and 40,000 filled the streets. Now the two Sami were a bit disappointed though because nobody had thought to bring any reindeer for them to see them. They hadn't seen them for over a year. <laughs> that event led directly to the formation of the Norwegian Geographical Society. And Nansen is appointed curator of the Royal Frederick University Zoolog Zoology Collection. It was a paid post, but there were no duties. And suddenly, he's now wanted, he's now known. Mm. This is his home, it's called Polar Heights in English. And there on display are the boots. They're Sami boots called Nutukas, and they came from that trip. And you can see the sending grass sticking out the top. And like all good leaders, Nansen said he couldn't have done it without his men. The trip cost 20,000 kroner, and Augustine Gamble paid half, Nansen paid the rest. <coughs> and for that money, they named a mountain in Greenland after his sponsor called Gamel Nunatak. Nunatak means a peak projecting out of inland ice and snow. Nansen then wrote his account of the expedition. It sold very well and it restored his fortunes. He is an excellent writer. Six months later, <coughs> he announces the engagement to Eva Sars. She was an accomplished skier and a celebrated classical singer. They had met previously, but the engagement surprised them and, he, and the wedding took place less than a month later. He was not a man to hang around. But before we move on, let's look at the Sami who went on the journey. They're happy living in the snow and cold, but they only travel when the weather allows. They're not into conquering obstacles. Ravner on the left looks like he's smiling, hmm. but apparently only smiled once, and that's when they'd finished the crossing. Hmm. <laughs> they are, to my mind, the first famous Sami. And they did apply to join Nansen's next trip, but he turned them down because he probably realised his mistake. Now, Balto, he wanted to carry on, and he eventually went to Alaska, and there he trained the locals to look after the reindeer that were being imported from Siberia. And for these two men, I do hope that they realise their efforts were important. Nansen's next adventure was triggered when he read Henrik Mohn's theory on polar drift in 1884, and that's the red line you can see there. <coughs> the ship USS Jeanette was crushed in the ice and sunk off the top of the Siberian coast, and her remains were found on the coast of Greenland. His plan was to follow the same route, but he needed to create a ship strong enough to sit on the ice, and then he was going to drift across and hopefully visit the North Pole. To do that, naval engineer Colin Archer designed an extremely strong ship. It had a system of cross beams and braces made from the toughest oak. And its other feature was this rounded hull so that the ice would push it up instead of crushing it. It needed to be big enough to carry enough supplies 
for 12 men for five years. And now when Nansen asked the government for a grant, they approved it. And he put a national appeal out for funds, and that was successful as well. He was now loved. The ship was christened Fram when it was launched, and that translates as forward in English. And the priority in the design was to provide a safe and warm shelter for five years. Otto Sverdrup was appointed as captain, and he was second in command. He was a ship's captain after all. And now when Anson advertised for a team, he got thousands of applicants. Competition was very fierce. And there was an army lieutenant and dog driving expert, Johansson. He got the last place as the ship stoker. And this is the Fram leaving Bergen on the way to the Norwegian port of Vargo in the far northeast. Vardo, sorry. From Vardo, they followed the red route around the Siberian north coast. But progress was slow because of fog and ice. And these are mainly uncharted seas. On Reindeer Island, this shoot a polar bear. They would meet many more on the trip. Fresh meat is essential for this sort of journey because it's a good source of vitamin C. Remember the dreaded scurvy. Seals were also a good source of food and all of the animal skins they got would make clothing. And they also picked up some husky dogs. These lived on the deck and many of them had puppies in this journey. Eventually as winter approaches, the ice stops them and they're frozen in, ready to drift towards the pole. Fram is here sitting on the ice and you can see a windmill in the middle of the ship. That drove a generator and they had batteries there because <coughs> they're into night time now, permanent night time. So at least they could see what they were doing. And scientific work started in earnest, taking sightings and soundings. The saloon's converted into a reading room. They've got lots of books and they play cards. Life was good and they had excellent food because Nansen had planned the trip really well. Yeah. Wildlife supplemented their rations. The polar bears were still a bit of a problem, but luckily the dogs proved to be very good alarms for when they came. The blue line is the route where they were locked into the ice. You can see how erratic it was. They often discovered they were going backwards. And this is a time when Nansen realises that he's not going to get to the North Pole with the ship. They're going to go past it. On average, they're travelling a kilometre and a half a day. And that slow progress gives him time to consider a new plan. Perhaps he could sledge to the pole using the dogs. And this is a drawing of him practising and crashing. But he eventually gets the hang of it. And then he announces that he's going to try for the North Pole with the dog handler, Johansson. Sverdrup agreed to carry on in command of the ship and continue with that all-important scientific work. So this is Nansen, Johansson and jo Johansson carrying out many practice runs. It's going to be a very hazardous journey and they're not really sure if they're going to get to find the Fram on the way back. Just after their second Christmas, the shifty ice tried to overwhelm her, but she still held together unharmed. The biggest danger for them was if the ice got above the main deck and fell down on them. <coughs> so when necessary, they managed to shift that away, but it's still, you know how hard ice is. The Fram had been extremely well equipped and they built three sledges and two kayaks. And as soon as light returns after Christmas, they set off for the pole. But there's a few problems with the sledges, they come back twice and they repair them. But eventually the two of them leave on what would to be a 15 month journey with Johansson always addressing Nansen as Dr. Nansen. Even when the two of them were stuck in their small freezing hut for months on end, as you'll see it later. They had to take a lot with them in case they had to find their own way home. But of course they were hoping to catch wildlife 
as food and fuel. Nine dogs pulled each of the three sledges, but there were only two men, and manhandling those heavy sledges over the ice blocks was proving to be quite difficult. And the cream line you can see is a sledge route that he took. And then they got to a point where they faced this huge ice barrier. There was no way they could carry on. So they marked their position. And in fact, his next book will be called Farthest North. On the way back, they made a mistake. They forgot to wind their watches. Time is crucial when you're navigating. You need to know where you are. They estimated the true time and then carried on. But from then on, they weren't really quite sure exactly where they were. Heading south off of the ice, progress is easier, but it's still slow. They didn't find the Fram and they headed home under their own steam. As they neared the expected land, larger bodies of water had to be crossed to get to the next sheet of ice. These are crossed by tying the two kayaks together and putting the sledges across. And here you can see the last of the three dogs with the two men. Late in the summer, they find more open water. They raise a sail and you can see there are unfortunately no dogs left now. And when they reach some land, they're not sure where they are, but to make life easier, they shorten the sledges and they carry on. They left behind what they didn't thought they could manage without. Now, as it happened, Nansen guessed that the headland he saw was Cape Felder. That's on the western edge of Franz Josef Land. But travel was starting to prove difficult because winter is now closing in. So they realise they're going to have to camp up. In a sheltered cove, using stones and moss for building materials, they build a small hut. And that is where they live for the next eight months. There was plenty of food and warmth because there was an abundance of bear, walrus and seal and it kept their larder stocked. The biggest problem was exercise in this tiny hut. But their plan was to leave as soon as the weather improved. But in fact it was May before they were able to get on their way. And a month later, after they set off, they have to stop for some repairs because a pesky walrus has damaged one of their kayaks. In the middle of this, Nansen thought he heard a dog barking and a human, and he went to have a look. And a few minutes later, he saw a man approaching with his dog. That man was the British explorer, Frederick Jackson. And you can imagine the astonishment. And after some awkward hesitation, Jackson asked, you are Nansen, aren't you? And his reply was, yes, I am Nansen. Jackson was leading an expedition to Franz Josef Land and they were camped at Clay Fora. And they waited here until Jackson's relief ship arrived to take him home, full circle, to Vardo. Nansen's route is shown in cream at the top there. But now let's have a look at what happened to the Fram, because she's going to carry on drifting in the ice. It was still a slow journey, but the men carried on taking the readings. Remember, that was the main objective of the exercise. And eventually they were released near to the west coast of Spitsbergen. And amazingly, both groups arrived in Norway at almost the same time after three years away. And I think you see that is some amazing journey that they've undertaken for both groups. Nansen returned to Christiania aboard his good friend Baden Powell's yacht, accompanied by their wives. And it was a triumphant journey, mm -hmm. and at every port on the way home, crowds gathered to congratulate them. When Fram is escorted into Christiana's harbour, she's welcomed by the largest crowds the city had ever seen. The monarch of Sweden and Norway, King Goska, received Nansen and his crew, and Nansen stayed at the palace for several days as a special guest. And that's his book, Farthest North. It became an instant bestseller. He is a good author. His writing is full of romantic nature, revealing his feelings with flowing descriptions 
of all he has seen and done. Polar Heights was built with the profit from the book, and he sets to work editing the enormous amount of scientific work recorded on the voyage. He did undertake more adventures later in life, but those two are without doubt his finest. So let's turn to Otto Sverdrup. Remember, he has accompanied Nansen on both of those trips already. And for a year, he captained the passenger ship La Fountain, which was sailing to and from Svalbard. And then the Norwegian Geographical Society decided to use the Fram to try and sail all the way around Greenland with the team of scientists. Nansen was too busy, and he suggested that Sverdrup take the lead. And his orders were to navigate, circumnavigate the island. But they realised it might not actually be possible to do that. So they gave him the authority to alter the plans if required. Sverdrup attempted to go up the Nair Strait, but the ice made it impossible. So he abandoned the attempt to circumnavigate and he overwintered on Greenland. And then he crossed for the summer to Ellesmere Island and they explored the land on skis, sledges and dogs. And then they moved over onto Ellesmere Island for three winters. This is them celebrating Norway's National Day with a parade on Ellesmere Island before they move on from one camp to another. He had south and then west. And they established new camps for the winter. And during trips from here, they glimpsed some uncharted lands in the distance. Every winter was spent getting ready for some seriously long land trips. Many of these took as much as 90 days and they left a skeleton crew on the ship. In fact, Sverdrup and his crew charted 260,000 square kilometres, which is more than any other polar exploration. Overwintering for a second year in the same place, they finished charting the three new islands they'd seen and named them the Sverdrup Islands. He returned a hero, and he officially claimed all three of those islands for Norway in 1902, which set off a dispute with Canada because they wanted them. This was not settled until 1930, when Norway ceded the islands to Canada and as part of the deal, they paid Sverdrup 67,000 Canadian dollars for his records. And a few days after this agreement, Britain recognised Norwegian sovereignty over the inhospitable Jan Mayen Islands. And of course that now has terrific fishing grounds. Another of his achievements was the saving of Fram and putting it into a museum in Oslo. He died in November 1930, just two weeks before the settlement with Canada, hmm. but at least it sorted out his family financially. And as an explorer, he did so much more than many others. That's why he is on my list. My final candidate is the Anglo-Norwegian, Karsten Borsgreving. Now, whilst all those expeditions have been going on in the North Pole, he becomes one of the first people to set foot in Antarctica on the whaling expedition in 1894. He then led the British Finance Southern Cross Expedition to the South Pole, and that was the first expedition to overwinter on the Antarctic mainland, and here he is taking some readings. They were the first to take dogs south, and in fact all but two of his crew were Norwegian, and he established the furthest south record of 79 degrees 50 minutes on the 16th of February 1900. The Hutter U still stands and he led the way for Shackleton, Scott and Amundsen. But his success was overshadowed by the upcoming Scott expedition which promised so much. Inside that hut you can still see this drawing that he made. It was not his fault that they failed to recognise his achievements. And this was rectified later. That's why he's on my list. So if you remember, I wondered who was the greatest Norwegian polar explorer. These are my four contenders, listed in the order I 
think they should be in. You, of course, can make your own mind up. But I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about my winner, Nelson. He wasn't a politician, but he fervently believed in independence for Norway. And he spoke in its favour in the Norwegian Parliament called the Storting. And when the country voted for independence and the monarchy in 1905, it was Nansen who was sent to persuade Prince Charles of Denmark to take the crown. Of course, he was successful, and Prince Charles agreed to become King Haakon. And then in 1906, Nansen became Norway's first minister in London. Hmm. Now, tragically, Eva was dying of pneumonia in 1907, and he resigned his post, and he went home to look after her and the family, the children. Now this was the time when Amundsen came to see him to request the use of the Fram to go north to the North Pole. And this was just before Eva died. And Nansen lent him the Fram, but only on the grounds that Amundsen filled in some gaps in his scientific work in the North Pole. Of course, Amundsen didn't fulfill that promise and he had no intention of doing so either. And so, at a banquet to celebrate Amundsen's South Pole triumph, with the king in attendance, Nansen stood up, and he announced to everybody that Amundsen would be going on a new five-year voyage north. Amundsen had no such plan. He was cornered, and Nansen got his own back on him. <laughs> He continued his scientific work and did a great deal of humanitarian work with the League of Nations. He did much to solve the famine in Russia after World War I. His refugee work was hindered by a lack of documentation for the displaced and he introduced something called the Nansen Passport.